Allison Copeland is the Biodiversity Officer for the Government of Bermuda's Department of Environment and Natural Resources. She completed a Master of Science degree in Geography at Memorial University of Newfoundland in Canada, then continued to work for the university as a research associate on seabed habitat mapping projects in the subarctic. In 2008, she returned home to Bermuda and began working in her current role as Biodiversity Officer for the Government of Bermuda. This role involves preparing and implementing invasive species control plans and endangered species recovery plans, as well as working with visiting scientists and students on research projects and liaising with NGOs on habitat management projects. At one time, Allison was caregiver for two hermit crabs, who you will meet in her talk. Please welcome Allison Copeland. Thanks for inviting me to speak to you about what we're doing in Bermuda towards conserving our land hermit crabs. I'm going to give you a bit of background on hermit crabs in Bermuda and their current status. Then I'm going to tell you about some of the recent development in terms of what new conservation work we're hoping to do. And I'm going to finish by asking a few questions of you all as a community of crab keepers. If you want to jot down thoughts as I go along, um, there's an email at the end of the presentation where you can send me your thoughts. I should begin by noting when we say land hermit crabs in Bermuda, what we mean is Cenobita clypeatus, because that is the only terrestrial hermit crab we have. So first off, where is Bermuda? Bermuda is a fish hook shaped archipelago in the Western North Atlantic. Our closest continental land mass is Cape Hatteras, North Carolina, which is just over 1,050 kilometers or 650 miles to the west. We are not in the Caribbean. We are about 1,400 kilometers northeast of the Bahamas. We do, however, share a number of species with the Caribbean and southeastern North America. Our flora and fauna have reached Bermuda either by swimming, flying, blowing in the wind or drifting on ocean currents. Between North America and Bermuda is the Gulf Stream current, which brings warm water north from the Caribbean and gives Bermuda a subtropical climate. Bermuda itself is made up of about 300 islands. What we call mainland Bermuda is seven large islands connected by bridges where the main population lives. There are a few inhabited outer islands and many small rocky islets. This is the geographic context in which we are doing our hermit crab conservation work. As you may have guessed from the fact that we are talking about hermit crab conservation, the population on Bermuda is not doing particularly well. We can ask ourselves, was it ever abundant? And why did it become rare? There is some evidence in the historic literature that suggests hermit crabs were once quite common on the islands. For example, this quote from 1907. Even later into the middle of the 20th century, it seems they were still quite common. Haas said in 1950 that they were everywhere in gardens and on hillsides. But look at this quote from just 40 years later, it considers hermit crabs to be near extinct in Bermuda. So what happened in the latter half of the 20th century to cause the population to drop? I'm going to explore that throughout this talk by showing you some of the threats and challenges that this species is facing. When starting a species conservation program, the obvious first question to answer is how many are there? We do not have a hermit crab population assessment for Bermuda. A rough estimate of around 150 crabs was made by a visiting scientist in 1994. And today it is unlikely that the local population is more than a few hundred adults. They are mainly found along the east end of the island and along the south shore. Um, this is mainly because that's the south shore is the less developed coast, 
It's also a distribution that mirrors the local distribution of the West Indian top shell. And I'll touch on top shells a little bit later. If you think back to the map of the Atlantic that I just showed, Bermuda is the northern limit of Cenobita clypeatus range, and our population is isolated from other sources of larva. So correct me on this, but I believe the larval stage is about one month, and it takes three weeks for things floating in the Gulf Stream current to reach Bermuda from Florida. So we believe our local crab population is self-recruiting. We think the Bermudian hermit crab population now is small but stable following historic declines. After how many, where are they, is the next obvious question. On Bermuda, hermit crabs are found in shrubby coastal vegetation adjacent to the rocky shore and in vegetated dunes at the back of sandy beaches. Occasionally, they are found on unvegetated or sparsely vegetated rocky islets, where they are vulnerable to predation. In these habitats, they use a variety of hiding places. We have an invasive species of casuarina tree on our coasts, which drops a lot of needles, and hermit crabs will bury themselves in this leaf litter, as well as in beach sand. They are also found under rock ledges, like these two on the slides. We often find many crabs gathered under ledges like this, where the limestone is moist and they are safe from predation. We have also found them inside rotting tree stumps and logs and inside coastal caves. The crabs on the rocky offshore islets are really interesting. That is one of the little islands at the top of the slide. If you were here during a hurricane, the waves would be breaking over the top of the island. There is little low growing vegetation on this island, but some of them have hardly any, so we really don't know what the crabs are surviving on or where they go to molt. Many of these offshore islands have important seasonal seabird colonies, so the crabs likely scavenge around the nests. Also, we put lots of rat bait around the bird colonies, and the crabs eat the bait in large quantities and take shelter inside the bait boxes. The bait is designed for iron-based rodent blood, so the crabs don't seem to be affected by it. The bait is designed to be appealing to rats, so there's probably something about it that tastes pretty good. We don't really know anything about the seasonal activity patterns of our hermit crabs. We don't know what they do in the winter. For a few weeks in January and February, our daytime temperatures are in the low to mid 60s Fahrenheit, with overnight lows into the high 50s. We presume the crabs become inactive when it's cold. Also, the timing of reproductive activity has not been studied. We have one confirmed record of a female with eggs from July 2010 at Hungry Bay. I wanted to show you this habitat in particular because this is the site where most of the studies on hermit crabs in Bermuda were done, and we think it's our largest colony. This is the mouth of Hungry Bay on the south shore of Bermuda. Where you see the white water at the bottom of the slide is the mouth of the bay, and there is this peninsula on one side of the mouth. On the inside of the peninsula is the calm water inside Hungry Bay and a now rapidly eroding mangrove swamp. On the outside of the peninsula at the top of the slide is the open Atlantic. As you can see, the peninsula is densely vegetated and has low relief rocky coast. Our tourism authority would like you to believe that Bermuda's coast looks like that beach I showed you on my title slide. In reality, most of our coast is rocky. Also, some parts are high relief and high energy, so not good habitat for crabs, and a coast that doesn't allow shells to collect. Wild crabs on Bermuda have been seen wearing the shells of a number of marine snails, like the beaded periwinkle, mangrove periwinkle, and several species of nerites. Occasionally, one of them, like the little guy at the bottom of the slide here, will pick up a milk snail shell. This is a terrestrial snail that is an abundant garden pest. The most popular shell choice, though, and the only choice for larger crabs, is Citorium pica, which locally goes by the name of the West Indian top shell. Ben Godsall was a summer intern at the Bermuda Aquarium in 2000. He made some observations of hermit crabs at Hungry Bay. 
he reported that 77% of the crabs had shells that were either damaged or too small. The little guy at the top of the slide is wearing a beaded periwinkle shell that is clearly way too small for him. We found this crab on one of the offshore islands. Um, that island has cliffs all around it, so even though there are lots of gastropods around it, their shells do not collect on the shoreline, so the choices for the crabs are very limited. Of the 85 crabs Ben Godsall collected, 81 were wearing sea pica shells. The modern story of these two species are entwined, and the fortunes of one depend on the other. So I have to go off on a tangent for a moment and tell you about top shell conservation. I'm sure as crab keepers, most of you are familiar with the shells of this animal. I've put a picture of his face there in the middle of the slide in case you've not seen it before. The early settlers in Bermuda considered the West Indian top shell a prized food item. Here was this large source of protein that could be easily picked up along the shore whenever the tide was out. So they ate them in really large quantities for about 150 years. By the mid 1800s, the West Indian top shell was locally extinct in Bermuda. We're not sure of the timeline of when this loss started to affect the hermit crab numbers. There are conflicting accounts in the scientific literature. Some say the hermit crabs survived on Bermuda using fossil or subfossil shells, which had eroded out of the limestone, but others dispute this. Obviously, the loss of the main species producing large shells must have been a factor in the decline of hermit crabs historically. The top shell was reintroduced to Bermuda from the Caribbean in 1982 and legally protected under the Fisheries Act in 1989. They have spread from the east end of the island where they were reintroduced along the south shore where they're now really abundant. They're uncommon still at the west end of the island or along the north shore. Happily though, you can now find places that look like these two photographs with top shells of all sizes grazing on the shoreline and in tide pools. To some degree, the historic loss of top shells is the one threat to hermit crabs that has been positively dealt with. However, now that top shells are once again becoming common, we have a few new challenges. There have been some recent prosecutions for top shell poaching, mainly by fishermen looking for bait, and it still occurs. For example, this photograph of 165 top shells was found by a group doing a coastal trash cleanup. Shell collecting and souvenir hunting has now become a problem as well. The border control agents screening departing passengers at the airport confiscate shells, coral, sand, and other things people are trying to take out of the country, both because it violates our laws and because they might be a biosecurity risk in the receiving country. In a typical two week period, around eight pounds of shells are confiscated at the airport. This adds up to a minimum of 208 pounds of shells a year. And that's just the airport, and that's just what is found. Most of our tourists arrive and depart on cruise ships, so the actual number of shells that are being taken is probably many times greater. The upshot of all this illegal collecting is that the airport authorities give us the shells to return to the environment, so we put them back into habitats where we know hermit crabs have been seen. Many of the threats our endangered species face can be linked to the overpopulation of humans on Bermuda. If any of you have visited Bermuda, you will know that our landscape looks like this. We have a country that is 54 square kilometers or 21 square miles of land area inhabited by 65,000 residents and visited by 800,000 visitors per year. We have one of the highest human population densities in the world. Many of the threats faced by land hermit crabs are linked to this dense human population. For example, habitat loss and alteration through human causes like foreshore development. All of the few remaining wild areas on Bermuda are overrun with invasive plant and animal species. Also, the habitats have been fragmented by the construction of walls, fences, roads, buildings, and other things that separate crabs from available food, shelter, mates, and safe access to the ocean. Crabs are also exposed to traffic, lights, and noise from man-made sources. Also, Bermuda is experiencing more frequent hurricanes. We've had seven direct hits from hurricanes in the last eight years. 
This is causing serious erosion along the coast and strips the sand and vegetation from the habitats. So the crabs that survived the storm, the storm surge and flooding, are then made more vulnerable to predators. Artificial hardening and steepening of the shoreline reduces the ability of the shoreline to accumulate gastropod shells for hermit crabs to use. The photos at the bottom of this slide are two examples of shoreline structures built to prevent erosion and protect coastal developments. With sea level rise and more frequent and intense hurricanes, we will see more structures like these. Such structures make it difficult, if not impossible, for female crabs to reach the ocean to release eggs. Females venturing down to the sea at night in the summer months are also liable to encounter something that looks like the scene in the top left photo on this slide. We have no information on what effect human activities on beaches at night are having on our wildlife. The crab in the rat trap there at the top right is what we call a red land crab. Historically, red land crabs were incredibly abundant on Bermuda. Beginning in around the 1950s, both the government and private entities began to persecute the red land crab as a pest because they damaged crops and they dug holes all over the place. Huge amounts of poison were used to try and control them. Undoubtedly, the land hermit crabs, which share habitat with the red land crab, also took up these poison baits. In an attempt to reduce the amount of poison being used, particularly on the golf courses, to control the red land crabs, a biocontrol solution was found. Yellow crowned night herons are known predators of land crabs. A few chicks were imported in the early 1980s and released on Bermuda, where they have multiplied and spread over the entire country. They have successfully reduced the red land crab population to a small fraction of its former abundance. I remember as a child in the 1980s seeing red land crabs squashed on the road in their hundreds during their spawning migration. Now I think it's been years since I've seen a single one. Unfortunately, but unsurprisingly, we've found evidence that the herons also kill land hermit crabs, but the actual extent of the predation is unknown. The great kiskadee is a flycatcher species that was imported in 1957 to control an overabundance of an imported lizard. This bird is considered one of our worst invasive species. They will eat pretty much anything they can catch, and Bermuda has an unnaturally high population density of kiskadees. We have evidence that they eat small crabs of other species, so it's very likely they're also eating land hermit crabs when they can catch them. Other invasive species that are also possibly affecting the hermit crabs are Argentine ants and two species of rats. These are, will likely compete with the crabs for scavenging opportunities, as well as attacking the crabs when given the opportunity. So that's the situation with the crabs. Uh, now I'm gonna share with you some recent developments. We'll start with me. I'm a recent development when it comes to hermit crabs. I'm a plant person and a geographer and an ecologist by training. I have a limited knowledge of crabs and I got involved with them because it was a niche that needed to be filled. When we went into COVID-19 lockdown last April, I wrote a recovery plan for Cenobita clypeatus from my kitchen table, using my limited knowledge and what I could find online. I still don't spend much time on crab work and we don't have an active crab conservation program at present, but I'd like to change that. And we now have a framework in the management plan. Bermuda has a protected species act that was passed in 2003. This is the law that protects animals and plants that are threatened in some way or need conservation management. That act says that what you can and cannot do to a protected species. Under the act, we make an order, which is the list of species to which the act applies, and they are regularly updated. The land hermit crab was protected on the protected species order for the first time in 2012. On the most recent order from 2016, it is listed as vulnerable and a level two species. This means that the penalty on conviction for an offense involving land hermit crabs is 15,000 US dollars or one year in prison. Things that are considered an offense are the willful damaging, killing, injuring, or disturbance of a protected species and the destruction, removal, or obstruction of its habitat 
also taking, importing, exporting, selling, purchasing, or transporting a protected species or its parts is considered an offence. The listing of the hermit crab resulted in this rather unfortunate headline in the newspaper. It's slightly overdramatic, but it brought some public attention to the Protected Species Act. One of the stipulations of the Protected Species Act is that each listed species must have either a recovery plan or a management plan. This is the Land Hermit Crab Management Plan that was written in April, May and June 2020. I've put the link there to it if you want to have a look at it. The plan summarizes the few previous studies done by local students and some of the relevant international scientific literature. The final section makes some recommendations on how to achieve better conservation status and learn more about the crabs. It is a mix of science and management. You'll see from the file name that it says redacted. That is because we obscure the exact coordinates of protected species before putting the documents on the internet. Through preparation of this plan, the gaps in our knowledge have been highlighted. We now have a list of what we don't know. The broad aim of the plan is to improve the conservation status of hermit crabs. We feel that we will have done this when we have evidence that the population is stable or better yet increasing. When we have increased our knowledge of the crab population, when critical crab habitats have been identified and protected, and if we can, we want to improve the quality of those habitats. We will need to have identified and addressed threats, and hopefully we will have the public support. Protected species recovery is not rocket science. You make more and you spread them around. This is really what differentiates a management plan from a recovery plan. In both, you conserve the population that is left, protect the habitat, reduce or eliminate the threats, and if possible, you make more individuals and you spread them to new sites within appropriate habitats. For the land hermit crab, we don't yet have that ability to make more crabs. That is why we have a management plan and not a protected species recovery plan. It is hoped that if we take all those management steps, the crabs will be able to make more crabs on their own. I understand there's some amongst you that have in fact been able to successfully breed hermit crabs in captivity, which is marvelous. We would be very keen to understand how that knowledge could be used for protected species recovery projects. For now though, we're focused on management activities to help the wild crabs, and we plan to tackle the knowledge gaps with some new research. The basic first question when you're managing an endangered species is how many are there? Followed by, where are they? So we need an accurate assessment of the abundance and distribution of our hermit crab population. Once we have a repeatable method and first numbers, we can redo the counting and mapping periodically to look for upward or downward trends in the population. We're thinking of using timed beta transects to look at relative abundance in a location. So any thoughts on what would be the best bait to use would be welcome. I've read some studies where coffee grounds, tuna oil, wet dog food, and bacon grease were used as bait for wild clypeas. If you know of a treat that your crabs can't resist, we'd like to hear it. It would be best to set baits at sites to do preliminary presence absence surveys for hermit crabs before committing to a time intensive abundance survey. Abundance surveys would involve some sort of capture, mark, recapture method to calculate the number of individual crabs at a site. We've done some marking and measuring in the past, as you can see from these photos from 2010, which was a quick survey with middle, middle school students at Hungry Bay. It is the marking that presents a bit of a challenge. For the statistics to give a valid result in a mark recapture study, you have to be certain that you've identified a marked individual when you encounter it again, so the mark can't fade or rub off. Marking hermit crabs on the shell is easy. Like my little friend there in the photo, you can stick something to the shell or you can paint on it. Obviously, if the crab then switches shells with another crab or ditches the shell for an unmarked one, then you're gonna get a population estimate from your statistics that's not going to be accurate. The obvious answer then is to mark the crab's body. The challenge is how to mark it in an ethical way. 
I've read some really horrific methods for permanently marking crustaceans in a way that is visible after molting. We need a method that isn't cruel and isn't going to harm the animals, because after all, we're doing this because they're locally endangered. I understand that some of you have determined methods for identifying individual hermit crabs, and I'd be very interested to hear about it, and perhaps we can apply it to these wild crabs. Something else we need to study is the crab's use of their habitat. This includes all parts of the habitat, including food items and other resources like shells. Studying their habitat use and diet will let us know as managers what we can do to make life a bit easier for the crabs. For example, we can plant some of their favorite food plants once we know what those are. Should we build structures for shelter in the habitats is another question. Having somewhere to hide from the herons will definitely improve their chances of survival, but what should those structures look like? Log piles, rock piles, or something like that. Also, given that the number of hurricanes affecting Bermuda each year has increased significantly, do we need to consider translocating some of the hermit crabs off the low-lying offshore islands and onto higher ground? Would it help the crabs out if we provided fresh water somehow in their habitat? I've read accounts of hermit crabs gathering around troughs used for watering cattle in the Caribbean. So we're curious, do we need to provide fresh water for them? Obviously, they've gotten by all right without it up until this point, but would it make their lives easier if we did? And if we do provide it, how should we do it? We're interested in the migration of spawning crabs to the sea. We don't think in Bermuda that they move very far, but that is speculation. Marking the crabs would help us answer this question also. We have no shortage of shells thanks to the airport and other sources, so we want to look at how best to provide these shells to the crabs. We'd like to put caches of marked shells on the beaches, in the dunes behind the beach, and in the coastal forest to see from where the most shells are picked up. Something we have done with other endangered species is establish new colonies through translocation. And we want to explore the possibility of doing that for the crabs. I would like to gain a better understanding of how they use territories, because we already move them around quite a lot, and we don't really know much about how that affects them. At the moment, we get crabs brought to us by members of the public, because they've found them in the road, or in their yard, or in their house. And in these cases where the crabs have been brought to us, usually we take them to one of the few sites where we know there are hermit crab populations, and we let them go. Since land hermit crabs are gregarious, I hope that when we do this, they just go off and join the others, but we aren't sure. Some of our other native crabs are solitary and guard their territories aggressively, so putting a new crab into the habitat likely would end in injury or death for someone. Last year, we started a bit of a publicity campaign to make the public aware that several species of land crabs migrate to spawn. We encouraged people to assess the situation carefully before picking the crab up and bringing it to us. If the crab was not in immediate danger or trapped somewhere, we wanted people to leave them alone to get on with going where they were going. In the past, we've removed hermit crabs from the offshore islands where the Bermuda petrel breeds. This is our national bird, which has a global population of 300 birds. We do this for two reasons. Firstly, because the crabs undermine our rodent control efforts on the nesting islands by eating the rat poison as fast as we can put it out. And secondly, because the birds nest in burrows underground and the chick is left alone in the burrow a lot of the time. We don't think the crabs would harm the chicks, but we don't want to take the chance. So when the crabs start to get large, we move them off the bird islands. Obviously, if we want to start a new colony of happy crabs, we need to be able to tell the males from the females to ensure that we can translocate both. And I must say, the Crab Keeper forums online were really helpful with information on how to tell the sex of hermit crabs. So in summary, here are a few ideas I've pulled together of things I've talked about in the last few slides. These are some of the areas that we as protected species managers want to gain knowledge, and I think we can gain some of that knowledge from you in the Crab Keeper community. Mark and recapture. I've heard there's a promising method of using the CETA to recognize crabs. Maybe we can try that. 
we need methods that will work in the field, so I don't want to be painting them bright colors or anything like that, which will draw a predator's eye. And ideally, we'd like to find a method that will be good for at least eight months. Uh, what treats would you suggest using as bait for counting studies? Providing water. Should we be trying to provide fresh water in habitats during dry periods? And what would be a good way to do it? Sometimes we make freshwater features in restoration projects for the birds, so how would we go about making these usable for the crabs? Shelter use. Do they retreat to the nearest damp, shady spot during the day, or do they have their own spot that they like to return to? And therefore, is moving them really disruptive? We would love it if you wanted to share any literature with us. Things that we can quote from, like links to articles and newsletters would be really helpful. We have some limited access to scientific publications, but we would be happy to get those as well. The photos in the online crab keeper forums were really helpful when learning how to sex crabs for translocation. You all spend time with these animals, so I'd really encourage sharing more photos online. When I wrote the plan, I was looking for an anatomical diagram to use, and I couldn't find one that didn't look like a cartoon or wasn't inaccurate in some way. There were some that are great works of art, but the, the legs are arranged incorrectly. I ended up drawing one of my own for the plan, which admittedly is not great. I'd encourage anyone who is artistically inclined to have a go at a proper drawing. We're keen to talk to anyone studying Cenobita clypeatus that might be interested in using Bermuda as a data point. We are the northern limit of its native range, so we might have something interesting for you. If you have a thoughts on any of these or anything I've said during the talk or suggestions, the email for the Department of the Environment is environment at gov.bm. You can send an email there with my name in it, and I've put my name there on the slide. The other area where I think you all would have some insight is how we manage our biosecurity concerns around the trade in pet hermit crabs. We have some very strict biosecurity protocols that prevent the importation of any plant or animal material without a permit. The customs department took these two little crabs shown on the slide from an airline passenger who arrived with them from New York without declaring them. Customs delivered the crabs to us at the Department of the Environment to dispose of. We had no way to screen them for diseases, and because they had no paperwork, we had no idea where they came from or how they had been kept. We recognized that it was a protected species, but obviously not from local stock. In Bermuda, because of our isolation, we do find that species we share with the Caribbean, Florida, etc., sometimes show genetic differences here. Often we have our own little self-sustaining populations. We're not sure if our hermit crabs are genetically distinct from crabs in the pet trade, so out of an abundance of caution, we don't want to mix pet trade Cenobita clapeatus with our native ones. This is how I became a hermit crab foster parent. I inherited the two confiscated hermit crabs. We were going to terminate them, but I wanted to see if we could keep them for protected species awareness events, plus they were pretty entertaining. When I got them, they were both wearing artificial ceramic shells. One was bright red, and the other was bright yellow with SpongeBob SquarePants painted on it. I gave them my childhood shell collection to poke through, and within two hours, SpongeBob had ditched his ceramic shell for a pica shell. Red took about a month to give up his ceramic shell. This unexpected encounter with pet hermit crabs raised a few issues. At the moment, imported crabs are banned completely, but the pet shops have historically brought them in. There are logistical and legal issues with a pet trade in what is now a legally protected native species. As a level two protected species under the Protected Species Act, the local collection of Cenobita clypeatus is prohibited, as is the sale and purchase of specimens sourced from overseas. We could be open to the importation of other hermit crab species as pets if they don't pose a biosecurity threat. So we would need to know firstly, how do we screen imported pet hermit crabs for pests and diseases? And are diseases even a problem with hermit crabs? If anyone has thoughts on that, I'd be interested to hear them. 
Also, I'm assuming that other species of Cenobita are not likely to crossbreed with Clypeatus, but if anyone knows of this happening, I'd like to know that too. I wanted to finish with this quote, which is on the back cover of the management plan. William Beebe worked in Bermuda in the 1930s, where he famously made the first deep dive to the ocean floor in a bathysphere. He seemed quite taken with the wildlife around his base on the outer islands. The quote says, if we live out our span of life on earth without ever knowing a crab intimately, we have missed out on a jolly good friendship. Thanks for listening and do get in touch if you have any thoughts to share. Enjoy the rest of the convention.